Disc 7 Sonnet Variations and Romantic Duels There are as many arguments about what constitutes a sonnet as there are arguments about any other field of human activity. There are those who will claim that well-known examples like Shelley's Ozymandias are anamorphic, not true sonnets, but types of catorzen, which is just another way of saying 14-line poem. This is an argument we need not enter. There are those who recognize poems of less than 14 lines as being curtle sonnets. Hopkins' Pied Beauty, which we heard in Chapter 1, being an example, and perhaps Yeats's The Fascination of What's Difficult is another. There is also a 17-line variant. These are called chordate sonnets, from the Latin for tail, same root as coda, which features a three-line envoi, or cauda, C-A-U-D-A. The convention here is for the first line of the cauda to be trimetric and to rhyme with the last line of the main body of the sonnet, and for the next two lines to be in the form of a rhyming couplet in iambic pentameter. Milton's sonnet, On the Forces of Conscience, under the Long Parliament, is an example. Here are its final couplet and cauda. May with their wholesome and preventative shears clip your phylacteries, though bulk your ears and succour our just fears, when they shall read this clearly in your charge, new presbyter is but old priest writ large. Those last two words, of course, writ large, have entered the language. In the 19th century, the poet and novelist George Meredith developed a form of 16 lines on it with four sets of envelope rhymes, ABBA, CDDC, EFFE, GHHG. There are traditions in the writing of sonnet sequences, such as Elizabeth Barrett Browning's 44 Sonnets from the Portuguese and Meredith's sequence Modern Love in his own Meredithian 16-line form. Christina Rossetti's Mona Innominata, being a sequence of 14 sonnets, is known as a sonnet of sonnets. More complex sequences exist, such as one of indeterminate length in which each new sonnet opens with the last line of the previous until you reach the final sonnet, which terminates with the opening line of the first. This is called a corona sequence. John Donne wrote such a sequence in seven sonnets called La Corona. More complex variations on that include the sonnet redouble, a corona sequence of 14 sonnets terminating with a 15th, which is wholly composed of each linking line of the corona in sequence. If there is no good reason for such complexity, it will look like showing off, I feel. Dunn's corona had a purposeful religious structure to make a crown of poetry to match Christ's crown of thorns. There are two very well-known examples of sonnet competitions, which reveal, amongst other things, the form's special place in poetry. The ability to write them fluently was, and to some extent still is, considered the true mark of the poet. On the evening of December the 30th, 1816, John Keats and his friend Lee Hunt challenged each other to write a sonnet on the subject of the grasshopper and the cricket. Legend has it that they each took just 15 minutes to write the following. I shall not tell you beforehand who wrote which. All I ask is that you decide which you prefer. Sonnet 1. Green little volter in the sunny grass, catching your heart up at the feel of June, Sole voice that's heard amidst the lazy noon, when even the bees lag at the summoning brass. And you, warm little housekeeper, who class with those who think the candles come too soon, loving the fire, and with your tricksome tune, nick the glad silent moments as they pass. Oh, sweet and tiny cousins, that belong one to the fields, the other to the hearth. Both have your sunshine, both, though small, are strong at your clear hearts, and both were sent on earth to sing in thoughtful ears this natural song, indoors and out, summer and winter, mirth. Sonnet 2 The poetry of earth is never dead, when all the birds are faint with the hot sun and hide in cooling trees, a voice will run from hedge to hedge about the new-mown mead. That is the grasshoppers. He takes the lead in summer luxury. He has never done with his delights. 
for when tired out with fun he rests at ease beneath some pleasant weed the poetry of earth is ceasing never on a lone winter evening when the frost has wrought a silence from the stove there shrills the cricket's song in warmth increasing ever and seems to one in drowsiness half lost the grasshoppers among some grassy hills in a recent internet poll for what it is worth 75 percent preferred the lee hunt and only a quarter went for the keats as a matter of fact keats would have agreed with them he thought lee hunt's clearly the superior poem it was the first one i read on the other hand the poetry of earth is never dead is one of the finest opening lines imaginable if you have read keats before one in drowsiness half lost would be a dead giveaway as to authorship lee hunt's sonnet scores we feel as a whole poem even if it doesn't contain such moments of perfect music the progression of ideas which is so much of what a sonnet is there to exhibit seems clearer and more satisfactory they are both petrarchan and both have clear volters at the beginning of their ninth lines the lee hunt sestet rhymes cdc dcd while keats sticks to the more traditional cde cde our second two sonnets share the subject of an inscription on the great statue of rameses the second greek name ozymandias one is by percy bish shelley and the other by his friend horace smith shelley's is more than a little well known but which ozymandias do you like best i met a traveller from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lips and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear my name is ozymandias king of kings look on my works ye mighty and despair nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck boundless and bare the lone and level sands stretch far away in egypt's sandy silence all alone stands a gigantic leg which far off throws the only shadow that the desert knows i am great ozymandias saith the stone the king of kings this mighty city shows the wonders of my hand the city's gone naught but the leg remaining to disclose the site of this forgotten babylon we wonder and some hunter may express wonder like ours when through the wilderness where london stood holding the wolf in chase he meets some fragments huge and stops to guess what powerful but unrecorded race once dwelt in that annihilated place of this pair shelley's is the first smith's the second as i'm sure you guessed even if you didn't already know they were both published in the examiner in 1818 and are both entitled ozymandias they each as you heard tell the same story the opening descriptions being in their basic outlines identical there all similarity ends there is something dreadfully comic about in egypt sandy silence all alone stands a gigantic leg if shelley's sonnet outlasts even the ancient monument it commemorates smith's will be fortunate to endure as a curiosity his is not a terrible poem but immensely ordinary by comparison perhaps you disagree shelley and smith as you may have noticed if you have been a good and attentive boy or girl have both dreamt up their own rhyme schemes whether you choose to write petrarchan or shakespearean sonnets in blank full or slant rhyme or adapt or reinvent as many poets have the form is there for you to explore i find it hard to imagine anyone calling themselves a poet who has not at least experimented with the sonnet and like wordsworth found in sundry moods twas pastime to be bound within the sonnet's scanty plot of ground pleased if some souls for such their needs must be who have felt the weight of too much liberty should find brief solace there 
as I have found. So now it's your turn. Poetry Exercise 17. Write a Petrarchan sonnet on electoral apathy. Use the octave to complain about how lazy and uninterested voters are, and then, at the volta, decide that apathy is probably the best response. Now write a Shakespearean sonnet on exactly the same subject. Use the first four lines for a description of apathy, the second four for a complaint against it, the third for an admission of your own apathy, and then in the final couplet express the concluding thought that what the hell, it makes no difference anyway. If you don't like this subject, do write your own sonnet. I think it would be a big mistake to leave this chapter without having tried to write at least one of each major form. Shaped verse. Pattern poems. Concrete poetry. A few words concerning imagism. Gamesome forms. Rictameter, ropalix, lipograms. Silly syllabic forms. Tetractis and nonet. Acrostics and more. The idea of shaping your poem on the page to make a picture, symbol or pattern is a very old one. The best known example in English verse is George Herbert's Easter Wings, which, rotated 90 degrees, takes on the shape of two angels' wings. Lord who created man in wealth and store, though foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more till he became most poor. With thee, O oh, let me rise, as larks harmoniously, and sing this day thy victories, then shall the fall further the flight in me. My tender age in sorrow did begin, and still with wickedness and shame thou didst so punish sin that I became most thin. With thee let me combine and feel this day thy victory, for if I imp my wing on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. Another of Herbert's pattern poems, The Altar, reveals the shape of its title, An Altar Table. When I was small, I remember endlessly looking through my parents' copy of the collected poems of E. E. Cummings, and being fascinated and appalled by the things he did with punctuation, his blithe disregard for majuscules and spaces, and the general appearance of childish illiteracy his work presented. My teachers, I felt, would never allow me to get away with such liberties, and yet there he was, sharing shelf space with Robert Browning and John Keats. The collection included his La A, uh, A Leaf Falls on Loneliness, which incidentally is the only poem I know whose whole title contains all of the words of the poem. Yet, of course, the poem is not just the words, it is the sum of the words and their layout, a truth in all poetry, but one most obviously declared in patterned or shaped verse. Cummings was a cubist painter as well as a poet. The symbol of all art is the prism, he wrote. The goal is unrealism. The method is destructive, to break up the white light of objective realism into the secret glories which it contains. I'm not sure how one would categorise such a work as the famous R-P-O-P-H-E-S-S-A-G-R, -S -S which looks at first glance like a random collection of letters and symbols, you can find the whole poem in most collections of Cummings' works. Unscrambled, the words of the poem reveal the grasshopper, who as we look now upgathering into himself, leaps arriving to become, rearrangingly, a grasshopper. Those may be the words, but the poem attempts to embody the movement, complexity, camouflage, wind up and release, the whole whatness of a grasshopper's leap, it is not meant visually to imitate the appearance of a grasshopper on the page, rather to force the reader to slow down and look and feel and think and unpick all the dynamics of a grasshopper's launch and spring. A conventional poem can use words and all their qualities descriptively and sonorously. A painting can freeze a moment in time. A sculpture can imitate texture, density and mass. Music can reproduce sound and shape, but what Cummings has done is to create a mechanism whose moving parts are operated by the reader in the act of reading. A verbal sculpture, if you like, containing a potential energy which releases its kinetic force only at the moment of the reader's engagement. Some of you may find this either a pretentious game or a stultifying dead end. I'm sorry if this is so. I would agree, however, that as with much modern conceptual art, 
The very specificity of the work's originality allows little opportunity for development by others. Cummings has had that idea. It is now ticked off in the box of high concepts, and anything else in that line would look like cheap imitation. This is what separates such works from forms. The sonnet and the villanelle are certainly not played out. Such poetic self-release mechanisms probably are. I suppose R-P-O-P-H-E-S-S-A-G-R qualifies as concrete poetry, a term that came out of a movement in Sao Paulo in the 1950s. Its manifesto states that the old formal syllogistic discursive foundation strongly shaken at the beginning of the century has served again as a prop for the ruins of a compromised poetic, an anachronistic hybrid with an atomic heart and a medieval cuirass. So there. Ezra Pound and the Imagists were concrete poets avant la lettre. Pound was influenced by the writings of T. E. Hume and by Ernest Fenelosa's pioneering work, The Chinese Written Character as a Medium for Poetry. Pound, Fenelosa's literary executor, found himself inspired by the idea that the Chinese ideogram, rather than displaying its meaning syntagmatically, rolling it out phonetically and phonemically in sequence, as this sentence does, actually contained meaning, held it in one visual unit. This tallied with Hume's idea of reality being process. There are no nouns in the universe, he had declared, only verbs. The upshot of this, and academics will forgive my blithe generalities, was to attempt poems that were kinds of ideogram. The best known example is in a station of the metro, written in 1911. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. Pound went into some detail concerning the composition of this poem in an influential article called Vorticism. He had been overwhelmingly moved by the sight of a succession of beautiful women and children on the Paris metro and I could not find any words that seemed to me worthy or as lovely as that sudden emotion, he wrote, until that evening, as I went home along the Rue Renoir, I was still trying, and I found suddenly the expression. I do not mean that I found words, but there came an equation, not in speech, but in little spotches of color. It was just that, a pattern, or hardly a pattern, if by pattern you mean something with a repeat in it but it was a word, the beginning for me of a language in color. I dare say it is meaningless unless one has drifted into a certain vein of thought. In a poem of this sort, one is trying to record the precise instant when a thing outward and objective transforms itself or darts into a thing inward and subjective. The new poetics suggested by Pound's thoughts on color, image, quiddity, and ideogram engendered a new kind of iconographic poetry, which culminated in his cantos, most especially the Pisan cantos, notable for their use of hieroglyphs and ideograms, and so far as most of us are concerned, their almost total unreadability. There is huge gusto and bravado in their best moments, but much to make the reader feel foolish and unlettered. I am not here to attempt a history lesson, nor am I qualified to do so, but I mention all of this as a background to the concepts that have propelled much modern poetry, most of these ideas being osmotically absorbed by succeeding generations, of course, not acquired intellectually. But that holds true of our understanding of, for example, gravity, evolution, the subconscious mind and genetics. Our understanding of much in the world is more poetic than noetic. We let others do the work and take their half-understood ideas for a ride, all unaware of the cognitive principles that gave birth to them. That those principles and their corollaries would have shocked and perplexed us had we lived in other times is interesting but irrelevant for our purposes. You do not have to understand Faraday and Maxwell's electromagnetic theories of light to operate a light switch or even to become a professional lighting designer. The upshot of imagism, vorticism, cubism, neoplasticism, constructivism, acmeism, futurism, dadaism, and all the other isms that flooded art in the 20th century was to allow a new kind of poetry, of which concrete poetry is one, the work of Cummings another. 
Such practices now inform the works of thousands of poets around the globe, since, unlike traditional metrical poetry, they descend from conscious ideas rather than techniques evolved by way of music and dance out of the collective unconscious of three millennia, their genesis did seem worth a small excursion. The point that seems to me most relevant is the notion of quiddity or whatness. I mentioned this when we were looking at Gerard Manley Hopkins, who had been deeply influenced by the medieval theologian Duns Scotus and his concept of heixeity or thisness. Novels can develop stories and character and much else besides, but poetry uniquely gives itself the opportunity to enter the absolute truth of a phenomenon, whether it be a feeling, an object, a person, a process, an idea, or a moment, through language itself. How many times will you, as a poet, look at a fly, watch a tap dripping, examine an inner feeling, listen to the wind, and grow immensely frustrated at the inability of language exactly to capture it, to become it. All the stock phrases and cliches enter your frantic mind, all the footling onomatopoeia rhymes and rhythmic patterns that we have heard before, and none of them will do. Painters, too, look from their subject to the tip of their paintbrush and their palette of paints and despair. That's not it at all. That's not what I meant at all. So poor J. Alfred Prufrock whines, and so do we. Aside from Pound, the works of that quintessential American in Paris H.D. Hilda Doolittle are perhaps the purest conscious attempt to adhere to the imagist project. Here is her Sea Poppies. Your stalk has caught root among wet pebbles, and drift flung by the sea, and grated shells, and split conch shells. Beautiful, widespread, fire upon leaf, what meadow yields so fragrant a leaf? It fascinates me that a medievalist like Hopkins and a modernist like Doolittle could both arrive at so similar a poetic destination from such utterly opposing points of origin. Doolittle's technique and effect are wildly different from those of Hopkins, of course, but I'm sure you can feel the same striving to enter the identity of experience. Silly, silly forms. Enough already. There are ludic and ludicrous forms, a world away from ideology and ideogram, which play on syllable length, shape and pattern, some of them bafflingly specific. What is the point of rictameters, one is forced to wonder? They are poems in the shape of a diamond. In stricter versions, as if there is any reason to be strict about so childish a form, I mean for rankly, the diamond is structured by a syllable count of two, four, six, eight, ten, eight, six, four, two. A variation is the diamante, where the purpose, as in some absurd weekend puzzle magazine, is to go from one object or phenomenon to an opposite or complementary one by way of a succession of related words. Wolf, grey, shaggy, slavering, howling, ripping, violent hunter, innocent quarry, frisking, grazing, bleating, white, woolly, lamb. The rule is that the second line is composed of related adjectives and the third of related participles. The first two words of the middle line are nouns or nominal phrases connected to the top of the diamond, the next pair connect to the bottom. You then repeat the process symmetrically down to your end word. The whole thing is daffy and hardly qualifies as a form for poetry, but I include it anyway, something to do on long train journeys. Another bizarre form bizarrely popular if the internet is anything to go by, is to be found in ropalics. A ropalic line is one in which each successive word has one more syllable than its predecessor. This sentence cleverly exemplifies ropalicism. There are variations, like increasing each word in a line letter by letter. I am not sure about trying variant ropalics. And decreasing rather than increasing the count stultifying, staggering, tediously complete, bloody waste, fuck off. Or there is this kind of thing. My feelings and emotions in their restless motions seethe and swell like oceans of the kind of stoic shuns, better find some calmerans. 
the dwindling but orally congruent rhyme returns yielded from emotions, motions, oceans, shins, and uns constitute diminishing rhyme, which may seem arid and futile, but George Herbert, the deeply religious and verbally playful poet whose Easter wings we have heard, used them with great seriousness in his poem Paradise. I bless thee, Lord, because I grow among the trees which in a row to thee both fruit and order owe. Certain other pointless forms demand a prescribed diminishing or ascending syllable count. The tetractis asks the poet to produce five lines of one, two, three, four, and ten syllables. Where's the tetra in that, for heaven's sake, you may be wondering. I believe it may be to do with a mystic tetrad in Pythagoreanism and Kabbalism and some astribble or other connected to tarot card layout and the four elements. One plus two plus three plus four equals ten is the sum on which Ray Stebbing, the form's inventor, based the poetic tetractis. No doubt he meant well by it. Those who choose to compose tetractuses are welcome to them, far as I'm concerned. And I really cannot see the virtue in flipping them too heavy on top, no? Mr. Stebbing is a serious and accomplished poet, and if he believes his form to be the new native haiku, then I wish him well. An even arsier form is the nonette. Death to those who compose such wastes of breath. They have no graces, at least in my poor eyes. They suggest useless traces of ancient forms more pure and wise. When people start to count, true verse dies. The syllabic count starts at one and increases until it reaches nine. Mine, in desperation, rhymes. Syllabics? Silly bollocks more like. Acrostics. Acrostics have been popular for years. Nineteenth-century children produced them instead of watching television. Those who were lucky enough not to be sent down chimneys or kidnapped by gangs of pickpockets did, anyway. So you want a dedication, then? For you, I'll do my very best. Read the letters downwards, darling, then. You'll see I've passed your little test. As the astute among you would have observed, the first letter of each line spells out a message, in this case, my name. But what is going on here, you might wonder? Age is a real bugger. So few years, ending up white, wrinkled, weak as straw. Incontinence comes, and I piss myself in every way. Stop. Eternity's too short, too short a time. That is a double acrostic. Both the first and last letters of each line spell out the same defiance and physical disgust. I won't interpret for you. You can play it again if you didn't get it the first time. In case you're wondering, I have not reached that stage yet. It is an imaginative leap. We are allowed those from time to time. All functions working smoothly last time I checked. You could, in theory, spell words down from the middle of a line. This is called a mesostick, and is just plain silly. The French seem to be the people most interested in acrostics and other poetic wordplay. Salomon Certon wrote a whole sonnet omitting the letter E. This is known as a lipogram, not the same root as liposuction as it happened, despite the apparent similarity of meaning. These days, you might feel, a poem that never uses an I would be the real achievement. Paranomasia is a grand word for pun. Thomas Hood, whose rich rhyme effusion you have heard, was famous for these. He went and told the sexton, and the sexton told the bell, that kind of thing. Keats slips most of the name of his hero in a line in the poem Endymion. This is known as a paragram. I will trace the story of Endymion. The very music of the name has gone. The letters E, Y, M, I, O, N there, being most of the letters of the name Endymion. There are those who loathe puns, anagrams, and wordplay of any description. They regard practitioners as trivial, posy, feeble, nerdy, and facetious. As one such practitioner, I do understand the objections. Archness, cuteness, pedantry, and show-offiness do constitute dangers. However, as a non-singing, non-games-playing, dancing, painting, diving, running, catching, kicking, riding, skating, skiing, sailing, climbing, caving, swimming, free-falling, cycling, canoeing, jumping, bouncing, boxing sort of person, words 
are all I have. As the old cliché has it, they are my friends. I like to say them, weigh them, poke them, tease them, chant their sound, gaze at their shape and savour their juiciness, and yes, play with them. Some words are made up of the same letters as others. Some can fit inside others. Some can be said the same backwards as frontwards. Some rhyme outrageously. Some seem unique and peculiar, like yacht and quirk and frump and canoodle. I take pleasure in their oddities and pleasures and contradictions. It amuses me that a cowboy is a boy who rounds up cows, that a carboy is a flagon of acid, that conifer is an anagram of fir cone and esoteric of coteries, that gold has a hundred rhymes but silver has none. It saddens me that the French talk of the jouissance of language, its joyousness, juiciness, ecstasy and bliss, but that we of all peoples, with English as our mother tongue, do not. Such frolicsome larkiness may put you off, but if you wish to make poems, it seems to be necessary that some part of your verse, however small, will register the sensuousness, oddity and pleasure of words themselves as words, regardless of their semantic and communicatory duties. Not all paintings draw attention to their brushwork. Art can, of course, as validly make transparent its process as exhibit its presence, but each tradition has value, and none represents the only true aesthetic. In fact, I shall start the final chapter with an exploration of the idea that there are no limits to the depth of commitment to language that a poet can have. Not before you have completed Poetry Exercise 18. Write one pattern poem in the shape of a cross, and another in the shape of a big capital I for ego. Obviously it should be a Roman I with serifs, otherwise it would just be a block of verse. Make the words relevant to their shape. When you have finished that, write a rhyming acrostic verse spelling either your surname or forename. Chapter 4. Diction and Poetics Today. How I Learned to Love Poetry. Two stories. The Whale, the Cat, and Madeline. I was fortunate in my own introduction to poetry. My mother had, and still has, a mind packed with lines of verse. She could recite, like many of her generation, but with more perfect recall than most, all the usual nursery rhymes, along with most of A. A. Milne, Beatrix Potter, Lewis Carroll, Strulpater, Eleanor Fargen, and other hardy annuals from the Garden of English Verse. This standard childhood repertoire somehow slid, without me noticing and without any didactic literary purpose, into bedtime recitations, readings, or merry snatches of Belloc, Chesterton, Wordsworth, Tennyson, and Browning. Then, one birthday, a godfather gave me Paul Grave's Golden Treasury. This solid, empire-made anthology, published in 1861, the same year as Mrs. Beaton's Household Management, and regarded by some as its verse equivalent, had been updated by the then poet laureate Cecil Day Lewis and included works by Betjeman, Auden and Laurie Lee, but its greatest emphasis was still on the lyrical and the romantic. That year I won the first and only school prize of my life, an edition of the collected poems of John Keats. In this I found a line, just one line, that finished the job my mother started and made me forever a true slave to poetry. I will come to it in a minute, but first a story about Keats himself, and then an instance of poetry in motion. The Whale When Keats was a teenager, so the story goes, he came across a line from Spencer's Fairy Queen. Not even a line, actually. A phrase. The Sea-Shouldering Whale. Some versions of the story maintain that Keats burst into tears when he read this. He had never known before what poetic language could do. He had no idea it was capable of making images spring so completely to life. In an instant he was able to see, hear, and feel the roar, the plunging, the spray, the great mass and slow, colossal, upheaving energy of a whale all from two words yoked together, sea and shouldering. From that moment on, Keats got poetry. He began to understand the power that words could convey and the metaphorical daring with which a poet could treat them. We might say now, 
that it was as if he had grasped their atomic nature, how, with the right manipulation and in the right combinations, words can release unimaginable energy. If not nuclear physics, then perhaps a living magic whose verbal incantations conjure and summon a living thing from thin air. Duke Theseus, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, put it this way, And, as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. For Keats, the grand plan of the Fairy Queen, its narrative, its religious, metaphysical, political and philosophical allegory and high epic seriousness, dwindled to nothing in comparison to the poetic act, as realised in two words. He would dwell in ecstasy on the phrase, his friend Charles Cowden Clark wrote later. This may sound rather extreme. There goes another typically high-strung Nancy Boy poet in a loose neckcloth swooning at a phrase. But I think the story goes to the heart of poetry's fundamental nature. I'm sure there must have been moments like this for painters, struck not by the composition and grand themes of a masterpiece, but by one brushstroke, one extraordinary solution to the problem of transmitting truth by applying pigment to canvas. Poetry is constructed by the conjoining of words, one next to the other. Not every instance of poetic language will yield so rich an epiphany as Spencer's did for Keats. There are muddy backgrounds in poems as in paintings, and poetry can never hope to rival the essay, the novel, or a philosophical treatise when it comes to imparting thought, story, and abstract truths. But it can make words live in a most particular way. It can achieve things like the sea-shouldering whale. You may not think it the finest poetic phrase ever wrought, but it unlocked poetry for the young Keats. Most of us have an inexplicably best-loved film or book, that opened our eyes to the power of cinema and literature, and these favourites may not necessarily be part of the canon of great cinema or great literature. They just happened to be the ones that were there when we were ready for them. First love comes when it comes, and often we are hard put to explain later just why such and such a person was the object of our ardent youthful adoration when photographs now reveal just how plain they really were. The Cat and the Act. Let me give you another example. This time it's from a poem by Ted Hughes called Wilfred Owen's Photographs. Hughes tells the story, simply and directly, of how Parnell's Irish members of Parliament in the late 19th century called for a motion to abolish the cat o' nine tails as a punishment in the Royal Navy. Predictably, Parliament squared against the motion. As soon let the old school tie be rent off their necks. Absolutely. Noble tradition. Trafalgar, what? The cat o' nine tails was, the old guard in Parliament cried, no shame but a monument. To discontinue it were as much as ship, not powder and cannonballs, but brandy and women. Laughter. Hearing which, a witty, profound Irishman calls for a cat into the house and sits to watch the gentry fingering its stained tails. Whereupon, quietly, unopposed, the motion was passed. There, to some extent, you have it all. Poetry literally in motion. Poetry literally again enacted, passed into act. Hughes calls the unnamed Irishman who cried for the cat to be brought in witty and profound for good reason. That Irishman did in life what poems try to do in words, to make the idea fact, the abstract concrete, and the general particular. The politicians run their fingers over the stained leather, real human blood flakes off, and the idea of the cat is no longer an idea. It is now a real whip, which has scourged very flesh and drawn very blood. That obscene carrier of flesh and blood passes along the benches, and the motion is, of course, passed unopposed and in silence. Essays, journalism and novels can parade political, philosophical and social ideas and arguments about corporal punishment or any other damn thing, 
but such talk has none of the power of the real. We use prose words to describe, but poetic language attempts, like the magician or the profound Irishman, to body forth those notions into their very act, to reify them. Poetry, the art of making, pushes the idea into becoming the thing itself, witty and profound. This wit and profundity might be harnessed to release a real whale to appear before us, or to compel us to handle the stained tails of a barbaric whip. Hughes made a poem that celebrated an act that tells us what poetry does, which is why he entitled his poem not Death of the Cat or something similar, but Wilfred Owen's Photographs. For Owen gave us not the idea of war, but the torn flesh and smashed bone of limbs so dear achieved. He gave us the fact of war. He called for photographs of the ruined minds and bodies of soldiers to be brought into our houses and passed along for inspection. The patriotic cheers stuck in our throats. Madeline. Madeline, ah, Madeline. I wish I could tell you that the line of verse that awoke me to the power of poetry was as perfectly contained and simple in its force as Spencer's, or that it had all the cold rage and perfection of the Hughes description of the Irish member's act of wit. It was a line of Keats's, an Alexandrine, as it happens, not that I knew that then, of a sensuousness and melodic perfection that hit me like a first lungful of cannabis, but without the great arcs of vomit, inane giggling, and clammy paranoia attendant upon ingestion of that futile and overrated narcotic. The line is from the Eve of St. Agnes, and Madeline asleep in lap of legends old. It is very possible that you will see nothing remarkable in this line at all. I had been dizzily in love with it for months before I became consciously aware of its extraordinary consonantal symmetry. Moving inwards from each extremity, we see the letter D at either end, moving through a succession of L's, S's, P's and N's. D, L, N, S, L, P, N, L, P, L, N, D, S, L, D. And Madeline asleep in lap of legends old. This may be bollocks to you, but I thought it a miracle. I still think it remarkable. It has none of the embarrassing obviousness of over-alliterated lines, but its music is as perfectly achieved as any line of verse I know. It was not, however, the sonorous splendours of the words that at first captivated me, but the image evoked by them. I found the line as completely visual as anything I had ever read. I suppose that, subconsciously, diction had been as responsible as description, which is to say the nature and physical attributions of the words chosen had made the image vivid in my mind quite as much as their literal meanings. It ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it, the song goes. It is both, of course. And what had Keats said? That a girl was asleep in the lap of, not a person, but some old legends. It had never occurred to me before that you were allowed to do this. It was like a nonsense joke or a category mistake. You can sleep in a person's lap, but not a legend's. Legends don't have laps any more than whales have shoulders. Yet straight into my head came a suffused and dreamy picture of a long-haired maiden, eyes closed, with armoured knights and dragons rising up from her sleeping head. An image I was later to discover that greatly influenced the works of Rossetti and the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood of Painters. Music and painting in one twelve-syllable line, but something more than either, and this something more than either is what we mean, I suppose, by poetry. I know this is all very fey and mockable, very sensitive, cardigan-wearing, weeding glasses on a thin gold chain old puff who runs an antique business and yearns for beauty. Ah, oh, my beloved Keats! Such a solace to me in this world of reality television and chicken nuggets. They don't understand, you know. Well, perhaps. I am not sure that it is in reality any more mockable than bloodless mirror-shaded cool in black jackets or disengaged postmodern quotation marks or sneery journalism or any style of cheap social grading one wishes to indulge in. 
I'm not going to waste time trying to claim that a line of sensuous romantic poetry is cool and hard and powerful and relevant and intellectual. Madeline. Madeline, ah, Madeline. I wish I could tell you that the line of verse that awoke me to the power of poetry was as perfectly contained and simple in its force as Spencer's, or that it had all the cold rage and perfection of the Hughes' description of the Irish member's act of wit. It was a line of Keats's, an Alexandrine, as it happens, not that I knew that then, of a sensuousness and melodic perfection that hit me like a first lungful of cannabis, but without the great arcs of vomit, inane giggling, and clammy paranoia attendant upon ingestion of that futile and overrated narcotic. The line is from the Eve of St. Agnes, and Madeline asleep in lap of legends old. It is very possible that you will see nothing remarkable in this line at all. I had been dizzily in love with it for months before I became consciously aware of its extraordinary consonantal symmetry. Moving inwards from each extremity, we see the letter D at either end, moving through a succession of L's, S's, P's and N's. D, L, N, S, L, P, N, L, P, L, N, D, S, L, D. And Madeline asleep in lap of legends old. This may be bollocks to you, but I thought it a miracle. I still think it remarkable. It has none of the embarrassing obviousness of over-alliterated lines, but its music is as perfectly achieved as any line of verse I know. It was not, however, the sonorous splendours of the words that at first captivated me, but the image evoked by them. I found the line as completely visual as anything I had ever read. I suppose that, subconsciously, diction had been as responsible as description, which is to say the nature and physical attributions of the words chosen had made the image vivid in my mind quite as much as their literal meanings. It ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it, the song goes. It is both, of course. And what had Keats said? That a girl was asleep in the lap of, not a person, but some old legends. It had never occurred to me before that you were allowed to do this. It was like a nonsense joke or a category mistake. You can sleep in a person's lap, but not a legend's. Legends don't have laps, any more than whales have shoulders. Yet straight into my head came a suffused and dreamy picture of a long-haired maiden, eyes closed, with armoured knights and dragons rising up from her sleeping head, an image I was later to discover that greatly influenced the works of Rossetti and the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood of Painters music and painting in one twelve-syllable line, but something more than either, and this something more than either is what we mean, I suppose, by poetry. I know this is all very fey and mockable, very sensitive, cardigan-wearing, weeding glasses on a thin gold chain old puff who runs an antique business and yearns for beauty. Ah, oh, my beloved Keats, such a solace to me in this world of reality television and chicken nuggets. They don't understand, you know. Well, perhaps. I am not sure that it is in reality any more mockable than bloodless mirror-shaded cool in black jackets or disengaged postmodern quotation marks or sneery journalism or any style of cheap social grading one wishes to indulge in. I'm not going to waste time trying to claim that a line of sensuous romantic poetry is cool and hard and powerful and relevant and intellectually muscled, it is quite enough for me that it astonishes with its beauty. Christopher Ricks wrote a book called Keats and Embarrassment, and while his thesis went far beyond the usual implications of the word, a sense of embarrassment will always cling to poetry that isn't hip like Bukowski. Oh, play that thing, says Larkin in his poem to the jazz saxophonist and clarinetist Sidney Bechet. On me your voice falls, as they say love should, like an enormous yes. I reckon an enormous yes beats seven kinds of crap out of an enormous no. Diction How does the foregoing, illuminating as it may or may not have been, help with the writing of our poetry? I suppose I was trying with those examples to promote a high doctrine of poetic 
diction. I'm not for a minute suggesting that some high poetical language be reserved for poetry. The language of the everyday, the vulgar, the demotic and the technical have as much place in poetry as any other diction or discourse. I am suggesting that language be worked, as a painter works paint, as a sculptor works marble. If what you are writing has no quality that prose cannot transmit, then why should you call it a poem? We cannot all play the game of it is art because I say it is, it is art because it hangs in a gallery so there. David Hockney once said that his working definition of a piece of art was a made object that if left in the street leaning against a bus shelter would cause passers-by to stop and stare. Like all brave stabs at defining the indefinable, it has its limitations, I suppose. It is not, as Aristotle would say, necessary and sufficient. After all, a large bowl of strawberry trifle or a buzzing electric dildo would make most people look twice. But we might agree that it is not so bad. Perhaps poetry is the same. Insert some poetry inside a body of prose and surely people should notice. The poet Robert Graves offered the game of telegrams as a way of defining poetry. I suppose we would make that the game of texting now. A telegram, sometimes called a telegraph, wire or cable, for those of you too young to remember, was a message sent via the post office or Western Union in the States. You would pay by the word, so they tended to be shorn of ornament, detail and connective words, asyndetic if you prefer. Arriving wed PM stop, leg broken stop, that sort of thing, much as are you ging out tonight might now be sent by SMS. Graves's theory was that poetry should be similar. If you could take a word out without losing any sense, then the poet was indulging himself unacceptably. He made great sport of Wordsworth's The Reaper. Behold her, single in the field, yon solitary highland lass, reaping and singing by herself, stop here, or gently pass. Alone she cuts and binds the grain. Graves pointed out, with some glee as I remember, I'm afraid I don't have a copy of his essay to hand and haven't been able to locate one in the library, that Wordsworth tells us the same thing four times in five lines, that the girl is not sharing her society with anyone else. She is single, solitary, by herself and alone. A needlessly extravagant telegram, then. Therefore, bad poetry. Well, yes. In his callous way, Graves is right, of course, but only right according to the terms of his own definition. I could erect a theory that all poets whose surnames rhyme with waves are dunderheads. Ha! Robert Graves, you are a dunderhead. I have proved it. The fact is, the telegram theory is nothing like good enough. We all know that repetition is a valuable and powerful rhetorical and poetical tool. What happens to the woods decay, the woods decay and fall, and break, break, break? Sometimes profusion and repetition are the very point. That is why we have words like anaphora, antimetabole, epanalepsis, epanados, epistrophe, palilogy, palyptoton, repetend and rentrement among many other technical rhetorical words for kinds of repetition. Certainly I would agree that in most good lines of poetry the thing said could not be said any other way, but that does not necessarily mean that each word or phrase must be semantically different. One man's pleonasm is another man's plenty. Commandments that categorically insist on contemporary language and syntax are just as open to doubt as Graves' telegram rule. Keats himself, as I have mentioned, abandoned Hyperion because he hated all the old-fashioned inversions, his features stern, for his stern features, for example, or for as among us mortals omens drear, fright and perplex, so also shuddered he, instead of for as drear omens fright and perplex us mortals, so he shuddered, and so on. Wrenched syntax, he felt, is no better than wrenched meter or wrenched rhyme. Of course, he is generally speaking right, as we heard all too clearly with McGonagall. But here is a line from that definitively modern poem, The Wasteland. He, the young man carbuncular, arrives. Why not he, 
the carbuncular young man arrives. It would actually scan better, perfect iambic pentameter, with a trochaic first foot, in fact. So if Eliot has not wrenched the syntax to fit the meter, why did he write it the way he did? T.S. Eliot, of all people, so old-fashioned. I could not possibly explain why the line is so musical and funny and perfect and memorable when inverted, and so feeble and uninteresting when not. It just is. I feel the same of Frost's unusual syntax in Mending Wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. These are the kinds of lines non-singers like me chant to ourselves in the shower instead of belting out Fly Me to the Moon. Here is Wallace Stevens in Le Monocle de Mon Oncle with a wondrous pair of double negatives. There is not nothing, no, no, never nothing, like the clashed edges of two words that kill. And then a deep uppouring from some saltier well within me bursts its watery syllable. Poetic diction is about two things, it seems to me, taste and concentration. The concentration of language Graves talks about in his telegram game, yes, but also the concentration of mind that never gives up on arranging and rearranging words and phrases until taste tells you that they are right. Sometimes, of course, they will come right first go, but often they take work. Much as you might walk briskly to work every day to get fit, instead of using a treadmill and getting nowhere, so poets can work on their poetic diction every day, not just when they're sitting down with pen in hand, practising sonnets. Being alert to language. Be always alert to language. It is yours as a poet in a special way. Others may let words go without plucking them out of the air for consideration and play. We do not. Every word has its own properties. There is the obvious distinction in meaning between a word's denotation and its connotation. For example, odour, fragrance, aroma, scent, perfume, pong, reek, stink, stench, whiff, nose and bouquet all denote smell, but they by no means connote that meaning in the same way. The more aware you are of the origins, derivations, history, evolution, social usage, nuances and character of words, the better. Their physical qualities are as important to a poet as their meaning, their weight, density, words. euphony, quantity, texture and appearance on the page. Their odour, in fact. And as with odours, notice what physically occurs when words are combined. Not just the obvious effects of alliteration, consonance and assonance, my occurs, being close to words just now, is a rather infelicitous assonance, for example. Perhaps I should have used happens instead. But be alive to more subtle collisions too. West and side are easy words to say, for example. But who doesn't say West Side Story, dropping the T? Black glass takes extra time to say because of the contiguity of the hard K and G. This kind of effect whether euphonious or cacophonous, is something you should always be aware of. You cannot pay too much detail to every property of every word in your poems. Imagine the intensity of painters' understanding and knowledge of all the colours in their paint box. There is no end to the love affair they have with their paints, no limit to the subtleties and alterations achieved by mixing and combining just because we use them every day, it is no reason to suppose that we do not need to pay words precisely the same kind of attention. I believe we have to be more alert. Colours have a pure and absolute state. Cerulean is cerulean. Umber is umber. You could even measure their frequency as wavelengths of light. Words have no such purity or fixity. So be alert to poetic diction, past and present, but be no less alive to the language of magazines, newspapers, radio, television and the street. I do not mean that in your engagement with language you should become the kind of ghastly pedant who writes in to complain about confusions between fewer and less, uninterested and disinterested and so on. Irritating as such imprecision can be, we all know perfectly well that when we see or hear letters damning them, 
They only make us think how sad the writers of them are, how desperate to be thought of as knowledgeable and of account. No, I certainly do not mean to suggest that you need to become a grammarian or adopt an academic approach to language. Keats and Shakespeare were far from academic after all. Keats left formal studies at 14 and trained for a career in medicine. Wordsworth did go to university, where he studied not classical verse and rhetoric, but mathematics. Yeats went to art school. Wilfred Owen, as a boy, worked as a lay assistant in a church and had no further education at all. Tennyson was educated till the age of 18 by his absent-minded clergyman father. Browning, too, was educated by his father and left university after one term. Edgar Allan Poe managed a year at his university before running off to join the army. Shelley was expelled from Oxford for atheism rather splendidly, and Byron was more interested in his pet bear and his decadent social life at Cambridge than in his studies. But they were all passionately interested in the life of the mind and above all in every detail and quality of language that could be learned and understood. English is a language suited to poetry like no other. The crunch and snap of Anglo-Saxon, the lyric romanticism of Latin and Greek, the comic ironic fusion yielded when both are yoked together, the swing and jazz of slang, the choice of words and verbal styles available to the English poet is dazzling. Think of cityscapes. In London, thanks to a mixture of fires, blitzes, ludicrous mismanagement and muddled planning, the medieval, Tudor, Georgian, Victorian and modern jostle together in higgledy-piggledy confusion. The corporate, the ecclesiastical, the imperial and the domestic coexist in blissful chaos. Paris, to take the nearest capital to London, was planned. For reasons we needn't go into, it managed to escape the attentions of the Luftwaffe. It remains a city of grand, tasteful boulevards, laid out in a consistent style where, with the exception of a few self-consciously designed contemporary projects, the modern, commercial, vulgar and vernacular are held at bay beyond the outer ring of the city, like barbarians at its gates. The English language is like London, proudly barbaric, yet deeply civilised too, common yet royal, vulgar yet processional, sacred yet profane. Every sentence we produce, whether we know it or not, is a mongrel mouthful of Chaucerian, Shakespearean, Miltonic, Johnsonian, Dickensian and American. Military, naval, legal, corporate, criminal, jazz, rap and ghetto discourses are mingled at every turn. The French language, like Paris, has attempted through its academy to retain its purity, to fight the advancing tides of franglais and international prefabrication. English, by comparison, is a shameless whore. This is partly what is meant by the flexibility of English. It is more than a question of the thousands more words available to us. It is also a question of the numberless styles, modes, jargons and slangs we have recourse to. If, by poetry, we mean something more than the decorative, noble and refined, then English is a perfect language for poetry. So be alert to it at all times. Poetic Vices Ten Habits to Acquire Getting Noticed Poetry Today a final rant. Goodbye. Further reading. Poetic vices. Laziness is the worst vice a poet can have. Sentimentality, cliché, pretension, falsity of emotion, vanity, dullness, overambition, self-indulgence, word deafness, word blindness, clumsiness, technical ineptitude, unoriginality. All of these are bad but they are usually subsets and products of laziness. Laziness in prose you can get away with. There are, it is true, Flaubert-style novelists who search forever for le mot juste, but they take their inspiration from poets and try to claim for novels precisely the same linguistic diligence and perfectionism that is an absolute essential in poetry. The real reason why McGonagall's Tay Bridge is such a disaster is that he did not have the first idea how much labour goes into the making of a poem. 
I do not believe that he was even dimly aware of the extremes of effort and concentration that poets a hundred thousand times more talented poured into their work. Much easier to indulge in the belief that the world is against you, that everyone else is a member of some club whose doors are closed to you because you didn't go to the right school or have the right parents, than to realize that you simply do not work hard enough. The first golden rule you signed up to when you started this book emphasized the necessity of taking time with poetry as a reader and a maker of it. I emphasize that rule again with redoubled force. I have shown you some techniques and forms of poetry and discoursed a little on diction, but I am in no position to tell you how to write poetry that will provide you with an audience for your work. Beyond technique, the call to concentration, linguistic awareness, hard toil and the taking of time, with all the benefits of developed taste and judgment that these will bring, there is, of course, such a thing as talent. I cannot give you that, and only you can judge whether you possess enough of it to make poems that others will want to read. For me, the pleasure of the thing is enough. Here, though, for what little they are worth, are a few more things to consider before we say goodbye. Ten Habits of Successful Poets That They Don't Teach You At Harvard Poetry School or Chicken Verse For The Soul Is From Mars But You Are What You Read In Just Seven Days Or Your Money Back. Concentration and total commitment to language are far and away the most important qualities needed for poetry writing. These other pieces of advice I have for you, hedged about with ifs and buts as they are, offer little more than obvious common-sense observations. They may seem too simple to be attractive. A complicated regimen is easy and for a while fun to follow, but the plain dictum, don't eat so much, while an infinitely better way of losing weight than any diet ever devised is much harder and usually less fun. 1. Consider the reader. It is only good manners to do so. Are you giving them a good time? Are you confusing them, upsetting them, boring them? Maybe you are, and this is part of a deliberate poetic strategy. Just be sure you know what you are doing. This leads to my next suggestion. 2. Keep a journal. Sometimes only by talking to ourselves do we discover what we are up to. Today I wrote a poem that was confusing and incoherent, but it was what I meant. Or was it? Hmm. I must go back to it. 3. Consider the voice of your poem. Who is speaking? You or a pretend authorial version of you? 4. Read poetry. I did warn you that I was going to be obvious. Most popular musicians I know are fans, first and foremost, owners of enormous record collections. I do not know of any poets who are not readers of poetry. You are allowed to hate some poets and be indifferent to others, but get to know as many as you can. Variety is important, or you end up as an imitative shadow of your favourites. 5. Truthfulness are the emotions, disgust, joy, anger, terror, and so on, in your poem really felt, or are you feigning them for effect? Readers can tell bullshit and pretense as easily as we can detect it in someone we meet at a party. Of course, artifice is a part of poetry, but again, be sure you know what you are doing. 6. Control. All bad poetry springs from genuine feeling. Oscar Wilde wrote, which is absolutely not the same as saying that all genuine feeling produces bad poetry or that all good poetry springs from false feeling. But genuine feeling is not enough in poetry any more than it is in painting or music. Genuine feeling, which isn't pressed into some sort of shape, is a tantrum or a sentimental mess. Negative capability and the objective correlative are rather hackneyed phrases you may want to check out via your own researches. 7. Enjoy yourself. Poetry might be a need in you, but it should not be a penance. Unless you believe yourself to be cursed by an unwanted vocation, the labour involved should be one of love. 8. Forgive yourself. Everyone writes shit from time to time. Don't get all hysterical about it. 
Keep your poetic toys in the pram and start again when you feel better. Write some light and stupid verse to take the taste away. 9. The muse is capricious. The Greek idea of a real living muse whispering in your ear is a good one and it works quite well. Sometimes it truly is as if we are inspired. The work flows, we concentrate, yet we are supremely relaxed. Beta and theta waves are active in the brain. We are in a true creative state. The muse is at our shoulder. But next morning, we may well discover that she has poured not wine, but ullage into our ears. You never know with her. Our own judgment cannot go to sleep. It is the same with writing when under the influence of drugs or alcohol. We may think they are giving us poetic nectar, but it can turn out next morning to be prosaic arse gravy. 10. Say it out loud. However much your poetry is meant for the page, most readers will say it, out loud or in their heads. Read your work to yourself all the time, even as you are composing it. Well, I did warn you that the points would be obvious. Suppose you have learned all you have learned from my book, followed all the precepts and avoided all the vices. Suppose you now have a body of work, however small, that languishes unread. And suppose you wish to do something about this. What to do? Getting noticed. Most people who paint and play musical instruments do so at home, not for profit or attention, but for their own pleasure. This is how I write my poetry, entirely for myself. I am therefore not qualified to enlarge upon ways to get yours noticed, published and talked about. There are many competitions, poetry clubs and societies, not to mention thousands of websites, chat rooms and online bulletin boards, which offer net-based or face-to-face -face advice, workshops and courses. Poetry slams and public reading events of a similar nature have migrated from the United States and appear to be growing in popularity here. There are outlets and venues for performance poetry, not unlike and often connected to the stand-up comedy circuit. New poets can be heard, applauded or gonged off like comics if they have the courage. I must add the obvious caveat that such outlets tend to promote a rather crowd-pleasing line in off-the-peg wit and ready-made satire, but this may suit your ambitions. The first opinion you should trust, I believe, is your own, so long as it is pitilessly honest. Ask yourself, through your journal or face to face with yourself in a mirror, whether you think that what you have written truly deserves a readership or audience. If the answer is an absolutely honest yes, then you will already have the confidence to proceed. If you are sincerely unsure, find someone you trust and who is patient enough and kind enough to look at your poetry or have it read to them and offer a serious and unconditionally candid response. Choose such a person well. Poetry Today. Sounds like the title for a quarterly magazine, doesn't it? Poetry Today. Well, in what kind of condition is Poetry Today? How is its circulation? Aside from the big guns, Seamus Heaney, Andrew Motion, Craig Rain, Alan Brown, John, Simon Armitage, Wendy Cope, Peter Porter, Caroline Duffy, Tony Harrison, Les Murray and others, there are hundreds and hundreds more published poets who continue to furrow their brows and plough their furrows in the service of the art. Are there schools of verse? Is there a distinctive voice that in fifty years' time we will know speaks in unmistakable early twenty-first century tones? If there is, I have yet to hear it. I am not sure that any poem written now, social references and changes in language aside, could not have been written fifty years ago. Perhaps this is just my own deafness or ignorance. I am aware that much in this book will enrage or stupefy some. The very idea of clinging to ancient Greek metrical words for the description of rhythm, the use of such phrases as poetic taste and diction, the marshalling of so many lines from dead poets, all these will have caused expostulations of contempt or slow shakings of the head from those with very certain ideas about where poetry should be going and how it should be written about. If we lived in a rich time of bountiful verse and alive contemporary poetics, 
then I would agree with them. Allow me to become a little heated and unreasonable for a moment, and see if you agree with anything I am saying. I think that much poetry written today suffers from anemia. There is no iron in its blood, no energy, no drive. It flows gently, sometimes persuasively, but often in the lifeless trickle of the inwardly personal and the rhetorically listless. This lack of anima does not strike me as anything like the achieved and fruitful lassitude of true decadence. It is much more as if the volume has been turned down, as if poets are frightened of boldness. Lots of delicate miniatures, but few gutsy explosions of life and colour. That perhaps is why the colour and life in the work of poets like Armity stands out so brightly in a dull world. The Victorians, for all their faults, had energy to spare. We see it clearly in the novel with Thackeray and Dickens, and in the verse of Browning, Tennyson and Whitman. The Augustans, too, for all their grandeur, had a real charge running through their couplets. Virtuosity, strength and assurance seem not to be qualities of our age. There are obvious reasons for this. Doubt, relativism, social sensitivity, blah, blah, blah. The short bursts of 20th century experimentalism Dadaist aleatory verse, Ginsberg and chums up at Big Sur with their acid-induced automatic writing and cut-up poetry, are now all older than the hat Tristan Zara drew his random words from. There is some electricity in the verse that takes its language and attitude from the streets, certainly, though also a great danger that such demotic diction dates even more rapidly than old-fashioned poetical language, but is literary poetry, ghastly as the phrase may be, all played out? Is it a kind of jingoistic fascism to bemoan the failure of nerve of our distinctive cultural voice? Fuck me, I do hope not. For my own taste, I would rather read the kinds of often extreme and technically flawed but always dynamic verse of a Blake, Whitman or a Browning than the tastefully reined in works that seem to be emerging today. It may appear contradictory of me to write a book that concentrates on metrics and form in some detail and then argue the case for wildness. Perhaps this is the most valuable and poetically fruitful paradox of formal writing. Technical perfection may be the aim, but it is out of the living and noisy struggle to escape the manacles of form that the true human voice, in all its tones of love, sorrow, joy and fury most clearly emerges. So free we seem, so fettered fast we are, says Browning's Andrea del Sarto, before adding the now well-worn creed occur I have already quoted. Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? Or what's a poem for? Goodbye. We have come to the end of the ode less travelled. I hope you have enjoyed the journey and that you will write and read poetry with a new energy and commitment and with deep, deep pleasure. Please do not send me your poems. I am horribly poverty-stricken when it comes to time. Before it was ever announced in any public arena that I was writing this, Word somehow got out, and I have already been flooded with more unsolicited verses than I can cope with. If you were to send samples of your work to me, it is possible that I might skim through one or two lines, but it is desperately unlikely that I could ever give them the concentration they deserve, or be able to write back to you. It's all I can do to find time to go to the lavatory these days. As for my poetry, I have already said often enough that I do not write for publication or recital. This is partly cowardice and embarrassment, partly a problem connected to the fact that I am well known enough to feel that my poems will be given more attention than they deserve, whether negative or positive makes no difference. They cannot be read without the reader being likely to hear my voice not as an individual poetic voice, but as the voice of that man who publicly disports himself in assorted noisome ways. My poems come from another me, a me who went down a road I did not take. He never entered the loud public world, but became, I suspect, a teacher, and eventually 
in his own small way, a poet. The End of the Ode Further Reading The Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics, 1993, Editors Preminger and Brogan, is, in my view, the standard work and final authority on all matters prosodic and poetical. Timothy Steele, Professor of English at Cal State Los Angeles, is one of the best living writers on metrics, and I would recommend his two sprightly but deeply scholarly books, Missing Measures and All the Funs in How You Say a Thing. Vladimir Nabokov's Notes on Prosody bears all the hallmarks of astuteness, clarity and cogent idiosyncrasy you would expect of the great man. It's essentially an examination of tetrameter, iambic octosyllabics properly, with a special reference to Pushkin's Evgeny Onyegin. The Making of a Poem, a Norton Anthology of Poetic Forms by Mark Strand and Evan Bolland contains excellent examples of many of the forms I've examined. I would also recommend John Leonard's student-oriented The Poetry Handbook, a guide to reading poetry for pleasure and practical criticism. W. H. Auden, T. S. Eliot and Ezra Pound wrote on poetry and poetics with great brilliance and knowledge. As illustrious practicing poets, their sometimes polemical insights naturally have great authority. The most rewarding academics on the subject, in my view, are Christopher Ricks, Frank Kermode and Anne Barton. I also fall terribly eagerly on Terry Eagleton and with affectionate scepticism on old Harold Bloom whenever they publish. Poets whose work showed and has shown particular interest in formal writing include Tennyson, Swinburne, Auden, Elizabeth Bishop, Donald Justice, Richard Wilbur, Wendy Cope, J.V. Cunningham and Seamus Heaney. Between them they have written in many of the forms I concentrate on in Chapter 3. The good old internet naturally contains all kinds of information. I would be hesitant to recommend any single site as authoritative on matters prosodic, but poemhunter.com has top 500 lists, which indicate fluctuations in popularity, as well as offering online poetry for inspection and links to nearly a thousand other poetry-based sites. <laughs>